Well, here we are continuing our series through uh, Daniel, uh, talking about being an unshakable people. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. And as we saw in the video, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived in this life of tension in Babylon. It certainly was not an easy place to live. Their faith was in constant conflict with the culture. And so many times throughout their lives, they had to take a stand for what they believed in. And I can't think of a single day that I don't wake up, that I don't feel some type of tension between uh, myself and what is true. Do I lie or do I say the right thing? Do I think the right thoughts? Do I act the right way? Do I slack off when I'm working and just take it easy? Or should I be diligent and work, as the Bible says, as if I'm working for the Lord? And I think all of us ultimately face those types of moments in our life where we have tension. We have this type of tension where we are confronted with ethical or moral types of truths that we all have to decide what we're going to do. Are we going to follow the external pressure or the external tension? Or are we going to, info- are we going to follow the internal truth or the internal principle? When I was 16 years old, I worked in a restaurant. It was a, um, a really high-end type of restaurant, and I was the salad maker. I also got the desserts ready, and I made little pizzas, little mini pizzas, and it was really fun. I had a great time, uh, and eventually I grew to hate that job, uh, like most of us do. We were like, man, this is a great job, and then about a year in, we're like, I hate my life, you know what I mean? But I was 16 years old, and I'm a kid, and that's just how kids operate, And so I'm making salads, making salads. Well, I had to accidentally cut my finger. And so, you know, when you're you're dealing with people's food, you have to wrap it in a Band-Aid, then you got to put a glove over it. And so, you know, I was working with two gloves, and we were really busy. Mother's Day was really busy. Valentine's Day was really busy. And and so it was just like, man, we were slammed. And it it was Mother's Day. And so working at night, and they actually brought another person in just to help me out because we knew that's how busy they were going to be. And these salads were really complex. I mean, you had to throw mixed greens, two slices of carrots, two cucumbers, two cherry tomatoes, two red onions on top, and then the salad went out. So there was a lot that actually went into it. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm halfway through the night. Yeah, I know, right? 16 years old. And so (laughs) I'm making salads, wow. And so there's a lot that was going into it for a 16-year-old. Not now, of course. (laughs) Pray for my wife, okay? (laughs) So I'm making salads, and halfway through the night, I looked down, and my glove had broken, and my Band-Aid was gone. Yeah. So not too much longer after I had that self-realization that I kept to myself, uh, one of the people who worked out front came in and she was livid, yelling at me and this other guy because there was a band-aid in this person's salad and it had blood on it and they had eaten part of it. It was horrible. I mean, can you imagine how like disgusted you would be if you went and that happened to you? And so like any young Christian man, I totally lied about it. She said, she said, who is this? And I'm like, look, I don't even have a cut on my hands. And I tried to do it really fast, you know, so she couldn't see the cut. I straight up lied. I mean, I'm not even going to lie now. I lied to her. And I was like, I don't know where this came from. I even convinced my manager to, to convince her that it probably wasn't for me. And maybe it happened like, you know, when people were preparing the, uh, the heads of, uh, of lettuce. And so I had this moment of tension, and I totally failed. And I have, I mean, even this many years later, I still haven't forgotten about that moment that I look back to. And I'm like, man, I had that moment where I could have bit the the bullet and told the truth, but I failed. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are faced with a much more dangerous situation here, right? They're not dealing with salads and band-aids. They're dealing with their lives are on the line, so to speak. And so we see this trial that they're presented with. King Nebuchadnezzar, as we talked about for the last couple weeks, last week he was humbled. Last week we talked about how King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and how he was going to ultimately lose his kingdom. He wasn't going to live forever. And he fell down on his knees before Daniel and he gave thanks to God and he worshiped God. And he venerated Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to some of the highest positions that you could have in the kingdom. Daniel was over the entire province of Babylon. But yet here we find Nebuchadnezzar had this incredible experience and this incredible conviction and he turns back to his own ways and he constructs this incredibly large statue made out of gold. It was 90 feet high. So if you could probably picture a statue about the size of this ceiling, it was nine feet wide, the Bible says, and everyone was commanded to worship it. 
So let's pick up here in chapter 3, verses 4, where it says, This proclamation went out to all of the land, and the proclamation was this. Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship immediately will be thrown into the blazing furnace. And so here we have this external tension being pushed upon everyone in the kingdom. And this is usually how tyrants roll, right? Every single person needs to do what I want them to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to be punished. No flexibility, no willing to yield at all. It's just my way or the highway. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is incredibly proud. He's incredibly arrogant. He wants to try to get rid of that dream that he had in the past. And he wants to make sure that he reigns forever. And so everyone has to submit to him. And now we find this accusation brought against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In verse 8 it says, At this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Little little tattletales, you know what I mean? Oh look, the music played and they're, they're standing. They're not bending the knee. Look at them being different. And it says in verse 9 that they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and the pipe and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. So they're reminding the king of his edict. And whatever does not fall to the down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Those people that you rewarded back in the last chapter, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. They don't even care what you have to say, king. A little exaggeration. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of your gold that you have set up. And so we find three men who are refusing to compromise. Now let me ask you a question. How many people were brought over from Israel to Babylon when the Babylonians overtook the nation? Well, certainly there were more than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We also know that there was Daniel, and I'm sure that there were others. And yet, the other Israelites are not recognized for their faith. They're not recognized for taking a stand. What does that tell us? It tells us that these people who proclaim to worship God have somehow compromised, while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have not. It means they've found an excuse to bow the knee, to succumb to the pressure, to bend to the tension. And they've even created excuses, I would think, in their own mind. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, we can still, you know, serve in a way that that doesn't bring us harm and we won't lose our jobs, we won't lose our lives, but we can still honor and follow God after all. And so they're coming up with excuses as to why they should bow the knee and they should succumb to culture. But these three men refuse You see, they developed a reputation for their faithfulness. They were recognized as people who would serve the Lord and their God only. And we kind of talked a little bit about this in the first chapter when we introduced the book of Daniel. Daniel made a stand. He decided in his heart that he was not going to defile himself with the food. And the reason why is this. What had brought them there to the first place? Was it not idol worship? Was it not forsaking God? Was it not bending on their principles? I mean, the very thing that got them there in the first place, surely they would learn the lesson now. Surely they would get it right. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they want to get it right. And so that's what they decide to do. Look what happens once they tell the king in verse 13. Furious with rage. I mean, we're only talking about three people. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in the city of Nineveh. Some people believe that it was maybe 200,000. And yet three people are going to cause the king to be so enraged that he wants to kill them. That's how tyrants roll. They can't even stand if one bully, or excuse me, if one person stands up to their bullying. And so it says here that Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not... Serve my gods or worship the image of the gold I have set up? Notice he drops the first accusation. The first accusation brought by the astrologers was this. 
they don't even care what you have to say. They disregard you. But King Nebuchadnezzar knows better. These men have served faithfully. These men have served honorably. These men have done the right things and respected their king. And the king knows this. And so he drops that first accusation and he asks them, is it true that you are not serving my gods or worshiping these idols, this idol they have made up? Verse 15 Now when you hear the sound, and look, I'm not going to repeat this again. When you hear the sound of the music, okay, I've already read through these a thousand times. When you heard the sound of the music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. Bow the knee. Bend the knee. Just give in. Follow me. Do what I want you to do. He says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Who is like me? Who could possibly be so strong and so incredibly amazing and so powerful? What kind of God could rescue you from me and my hand? And so he's got this enormous blazing furnace, which probably looks something of this nature. The king would sit up on his uh, palace and he would look out and there would be this gigantic furnace that he would actually be able to look down into. And it was probably fed from underneath the ground and they would feed whatever type of energy, such as coal or whatever, into that furnace and they would make it really hot, probably wood, not coal. And so they would make it really hot and he would see people be thrown down into it and he would watch them burn alive as he sentenced them to their execution and so they got this external tension bow or die and so what do they do they know that they could lose their position they know that they could lose their situation they know that they could lose even their own lives but deep down inside they've got this internal truth you see this external tension versus this internal truth what decision are you going to make all you got to do is conform All you got to do is bend the knee. And of course, that would mean disobedience to God. You see, they received this law in Exodus chapter 20, which says this. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth or in the water or under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. No Buddhas in the corner. No elephants around your neck. Nothing. No idols. Don't, Don't make them. And I don't know about you, but I think that we all face similar situations and trials today. Maybe not to the magnitude of losing our own lives, but a lot of us, for instance, students in here, they face popularity at school. Do you give in to the LGBT agenda? Do you bow under the social pressure of sexual immorality? Do you risk losing your friends for taking a stand up for God? We can sear our conscience in church service, telling ourselves that we've done enough, we've given enough, we've sacrificed enough, we've been in church enough. We don't need to do that. Let someone else do it for once. Maybe our position at work, by doing that which our boss or our company requires to be illegal, unethical, or immoral, just just smudge the numbers a little bit. You don't really have to document all your time. Just take it easy. After all, they've got to pay the bill. Well, maybe, maybe we want to save a sexual relationship with someone, and so we give in to sexual pressure. We give in to this type of relationship standard that we know deep down inside is wrong. Maybe we're pressured by our peers to conform to drunkenness and debauchery. One of the greatest regrets that I have, you see, I fell in love with Jesus my senior year in high school, but I decided to go on senior week, and I made a resolution. I know what goes on at senior week. I know what people do. They get drunk. They go crazy. They party. I'm going to go, and I'm just going to have fun, and I'm just going to enjoy the time, but I'm not going to do that because I love Jesus now. And I went to senior week down at Myrtle Beach. Day one passed flawless. Day two passed flawless flawless. I was in love with Jesus. Day three hit and I couldn't take the pressure anymore. I gave in. I ended up drinking, getting drunk, and I became like one of them. And I look back at that many years later and I wish I would have taken a stand. I wish I would have been strong enough to reject that social pressure and that tension that I felt, but I wasn't. You see, I can look back on my life and I have regret. I know what it feels like to make those bad decisions. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know the same thing. They know what it was like to live in Israel, worshiping idols, doing things that God didn't want them to do, and they they made the resolution, I'm not going to go back, I'm not going to do that anymore. And so yes, it could be easy to conform, to go along with the crowd. No one will really know, but yet they're taking a stand. 
James chapter 4 verse 17 says this, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. If you know what is right and you don't do it, the Bible says that is sin. Verse 16 of Daniel chapter 3, we see their their testimony, their, their faith demonstrated where it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, This is probably one of the greatest verses in the entire Bible about this illustration and this demonstration of faith. I mean, if I could walk away with anything from the entire Bible, it would have this type of attitude, this type of mindset. And so they're before the king, he says, bow or die, and they say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves to you in this matter. And they're not being arrogant. They're saying, look, we've got nothing to say. We've got no reply. We've got no explanation that could try to get us out of this situation. Verse 17, they say this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. We believe and we have trust and we have faith that the situation that God has placed us in, he will be able to bring us out of it and save us. But then the most important mindset, attitude And the entire Bible, I would say, is this. Look at what they say. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Even if God doesn't save us, we are still going to trust and follow him to our death. Even if God doesn't save me from this situation. I will not bow the knee. I will not give in to the tension. I will not succumb to the pressure. I am going to follow God no matter what the cost. I can't imagine being in this type of situation. Maybe my own child's life is at stake, my life, my wife's, yours. I cannot imagine standing and looking at a fire, being tempted with being burned alive, and say, you know what? I don't care what you have to say. I am going to follow God. And the reason why I'm so scared about that is because I look back to a 16-year-old me or an 18-year-old me and I see how I couldn't even stand up to my friends for three days with drinking or cutting my finger with a salad at work and I question and I wonder about my own integrity. But I believe as a faithful follower of Christ that if I were to be put to the test, I would pass. And the funny thing about putting yourself out there like that is sometimes when you preach on tests, they tend to come right around the corner. You see, it was God's will not to deliver them. And they were determined to honor God even if he didn't save them. And this is all throughout the Bible. Different people, different heroes of faith have the same type of attitude. For instance, Job in the Old Testament. Job is arguably one of the oldest books in the entire Old Testament, which actually predates Abraham that we have recorded in history. And Job had everything taken from him. Uh, God allowed a natural disaster to come upon Job's uh, home, and all of his children had passed away. He actually uh, caused his body to be allowed to to, to break out with boils. I mean, gigantic pus-filled balls all over his body that were sensitive to the touch. He was in extreme pain. He lost all of his income. He lost his home. He lost his family. And yet Job said this. Job got up once this happened. He tore his robe, he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship. Even his wife said, just curse God and die. You must have done something to cause this situation to happen. Job said, naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord has given to me, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all of this, the Bible says, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He goes on to say, though he slay me, my hope will be in him. You could look at Habakkuk. It says in chapter 3, verses 17, Habakkuk was a prophet and he had endured the suffering of Babylon. So he's somewhat of a contemporary with with Daniel. And he's in southern Israel at this time after the Babylonians had come in and destroyed Judah and, and captured all of the people. And he gives a recount of what it was like, I mean, think about it, what it would be like to have a 200,000 man army or something of that nature come marching upon your city, the the beating of the drums, the hearing of the screams. I mean, this would be an incredibly terrifying experience. And the prophet writes this, I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. He says, I was was afraid, I was scared of what was going to happen. 
Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and so he gets a little poetic here, and there there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will put my joy in God my Savior. He says, even though we have nothing, I will serve and rejoice in the Lord. You could look at the apostles in Acts chapter 5. They were brought before different councils because they were preaching the word of God. Jesus is alive. He's resurrected from the dead. And they were brought before councils. They were threatened with being killed, stoned to death, imprisoned. And so they were brought before this Jewish council. Peter was. And they said, you have got to stop preaching about Jesus. You're turning the world upside down. Just stop it. And Peter says this. We must obey God rather than human beings. And there is something about civil, civil disobedience that the Bible is very adamant about. That when it comes to conflict with your faith and you following God, you do not give an inch. I don't care if the candidate isn't pro-life. I don't care if the candidate believes in uh, some type of social standard or some type of idea that is counter to your belief in Jesus. The Bible tells us, do not give an inch. And when you only have two choices, you certainly should choose the lesser of two evils rather than standing on maybe your own pride or your own, your, your own arrogance, preventing evil and pushing back against it. I'd like to give you an illustration, for instance, about a man named Polycarp. He was a disciple of John in the first hundred years after the Bible was actually starting to be written. And he was being hunted by the Romans because he preached about Jesus. And you can actually read about this in the historical record. And so they traced him down to a house he was living on the outskirts, and they were going to burn him alive at the stake. And he was resolute. He wasn't going to denounce his Lord and Savior. He wasn't going to denounce Jesus Christ. And Polycarp said this, ready to be burned alive. And he said, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of thy beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we receive the knowledge of thee, the God of angels and the powers of all creation and of the whole race of righteousness who live in thy presence. He's praising God and worshiping God and recognizing the greatness of God as he's ready to be burned alive. I cannot imagine being in that type of situation. Yet Polycarp would not give in. And so we've got Job and we've got prophets and we've got apostles and we've got Christian followers who absolutely refuse to give in to social pressure. Well, let's pick up the story where we left it off. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19. It says the Nebuchadnezzar was furious. Sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not giving in. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He was so angry that his face began to contour and twist. And he was just so enraged, like a little child, just totally exasperated at the stand that these men took. And he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. This was really stupid, and this is why. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army, the best of the best, to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so these men, wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, this is how enraged he is, that he takes the best of the best to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They throw them into the fire and they die in the process. That's how hot this furnace is. And it says that these three men were firmly tied and they fell into the blazing furnace. And then something amazing happens. A miracle takes place. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Wait a second. I mean, you ever have one of those moments? You're like, wait, what is that? Weren't there only three men that we threw in there? I mean, you got to be kind of sick to want to watch people burn alive. But Nebuchadnezzar is watching this, and that's how mad and angry he is. And he sees something that's going on in the furnace. Look what it says. Look, he says. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. I thought we only threw three people in. 
And now there's four. Some people believe that this was an angel. Some people believe that this was a pre-incarnate uh, view of Jesus, that Jesus, before he took on human flesh, came and walked through the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says in verse 26 that Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out here. Can you imagine what was going through the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Be like, wow, look at this fire. You know what I mean? I don't think, I think that they were shaking in fear and they were like, maybe like screaming. I'd have been screaming. I'm like, ah! You know, don't throw me in. That's probably what I would have been do- doing. But they were, you know, I don't know if they were quiet or whatever. But then they're just walking around in this fire and there's this fourth person there and they're like, hey man, who are you? He's like, I am the Lord. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how this went down. <coughs> But he says, come out here. And so in verse 26, it says, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And then the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the royal advisors crowded around them. I mean, I mean they, they came out of this fire. And it says that they were totally unharmed. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. And their robes were not scorched. And there was no even smell of fire on them. I mean, you can't even be around a campfire without walking away. It's like one of the worst parts about a campfire. Like, I feel so sticky and gross because I smell like fire. You know what I mean? And uh, unless you're a man, you know. <laughs> I like fire. I like to smell like fire because I'm a man. <laughs> Sorry about that. It says in verse 28 that Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God. The God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or any language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. He's like, you might be able to get out of a fire, but you can't put your body back together. <laughs> And their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save that way. I like that. No other God can save that way. And it was amazing how the very thing presumed to destroy them was the very thing that enabled them to walk free. And so too our trials can be. That when you face trials in your family, or at work, or even internally, the very things that are tempting you to set out to destroy you are the very things that if you take a stand, if you are immovable, if you are unshakable, could be the very thing that sets you free. Look at their reward in verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And so here we have these men of faith, men of courage, men of stature, unshakable. They have learned their lesson, and they are only about 20 to 23 years old. That's incredible, if you ask me. They refuse to recant. They refuse to give in. One of the most important men from church history, his name is uh, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther grew up uh, and was trained in the Catholic church. And Martin Luther was able to get access to a Bible, and he actually translated one of the Latin Bibles uh, I believe in into German, if if I'm thinking correctly. And so, as he started studying his Bible, he started reading about certain things that just seemed off. I mean, paying for indulgences, praying to saints, and there were about 95 things that Martin Luther, after he read through his Bible and studied, was like, "This just this isn't right." And so he wrote 95 theses, wrote them down right? Couldn't type on a computer. And he took him to this gigantic door and he nailed all 95 up against this door. And he wrote and he preached and he converted. Well, as you can imagine, anybody that takes a stand is going to be in some trouble. And so the Catholic Church summoned him and gave him safe passage. They summoned him before a council so that he could give an account for uh, his teachings and his writings and his doctrines. And they demanded that he recant. Otherwise, he would be excommunicated from the church. He would be labeled as a rebel and a heretic. And ultimately, he was actually sentenced to death. He had a a death sentence on his head. That if you killed Martin Luther, it was really no big of a deal. uh, And you wouldn't be punished for it. 
And so here is Martin Luther standing before this gigantic council of men who want to kill him, who want him to recant. And Martin Luther said this, Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God, and I cannot and I will not recant anything for to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. He says, I refuse to recant because I know what is right. And that's what God wants for you, and that's what God wants for me. The refusal to bow the knee to the social tension, to the pressure, and to the lies of the world that we face. Take a stand for who you are and for what you believe in. And one of the greatest ways that God wants you to take a stand is to confess your faith in him and obey the gospel. To publicly declare, God, I follow you. And it's in that moment of the Christian baptism that you receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you declare, I am a follower of Jesus. But until you take a stand for God, you're just a part of the crowd, bending the knee, following the way of the world. And so we're going to invite you to stand and sing this song of invitation and pray. And if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you want to take a stand for what you know to be right in your heart, we're going to invite you to do that now. So will you pray with me? God, we love you and we thank you for our time together. We thank you for people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who absolutely refuse to bow the knee to culture and to pressure. God, I thank you for men like Martin Luther who was unwilling to recant even in the face of death. Thank you for Job and Peter and the apostles. God, thank you for people like the prophets who followed you and did not remove their love and their faithfulness. God, give us the courage, give us the strength to be able to follow you no matter what, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.